Hello everyone, uh, a very warm welcome or welcome back to Crash Course Economics. Uh, it's lovely to see you all here. This is the second webinar of our third Crash Course series and this time the topic is Big Tech and we'll tell you more about that later. For now, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. Perhaps you can say who you are, where you're based, what you're doing and what brings you here. So uh, myself, I'm Sarah, I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition uh, at the Transnational Institute and I'll be your host today, together with the co-host Rodrigo Fernandez, uh, who is a researcher at SOMO. And behind the scenes, we have our team uh, consisting of uh, Jeremy Krollsmith, who's a web developer and designed our website, Kees Hudig from globalinfo.nl and Jenny Pannebecker, who is a communications officer at SOMO. And they're working very hard today uh, to make this webinar a success again. So let me start by explaining a little bit what Crash Course actually is. So we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from uh, numerous organizations. And at the start of the Corona crisis, uh, we united uh, because we wanted to understand what's going on. Uh, what is this crisis about, how it changes the world, and also reflect on the challenges we're faced with uh, and also possible solutions. Crash Course is set up as a platform, a digital platform designed to open up the debates on how we can move out of the current crisis and also uh, regarding the future, make the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. And in order to do that, we're inviting global experts from all over the world to break down complex, uh, mainly economic and financial issues and make them accessible to you all so that we can shape our economic system together in a just and democratic way. And in that way, we hope to democratize knowledge and give you the necessary tools, tools you need to change the world. So this time for this series, um, we decided to discuss the challenges related to some of the big COVID winners, uh, amongst which uh, Big Tech. And there'll be probably five and perhaps even six webinars in this series every two weeks. Um, and in each webinar, we provide you with a one hour crash course on specific uh, topics that make you understand our contemporary economy and society a bit better. And you can watch all former webinars, also from the first and the second series uh, on our website, crashcourseeconomics.org. And there's always also a podcast version and a summary uh, of the webinar. And this also goes for today's webinar, of course. Um, the last webinar was with King Birch uh, and the webinar is already um, published on our website there. Um, I think we have a new category, which is the good news of today. Last time it was Jens van het Klooster who obtained his uh, PhD, a second PhD actually uh, in the field of uh, monetary economics. And Jens was a crash course speaker in our first series uh, on uh, monetary policy. And today's news is also quite groundbreaking. Uh, it's namely that the US is supporting the TRIPS waiver, which means that um, the patents related to the COVID vaccines uh, might actually become wavered, uh, which will mean that uh, COVID vaccines will become accessible to all because they can be produced on a mass scale. So that's the good news of today. So uh, now, Rodrigo, can you tell us something about the first two series and also this series? Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. So this is the, the third series um, of our crash course webinars. Uh, we started when the pandemic was still fresh and central banks once again had to step in and basically rescue the world by pouring massive amounts of liquidity in the global financial system. Um, so in the first series, we explored uh, the role of central banks uh, in well, the contemporary capitalism. The second series was about the looming debt crisis in the global south, and we asked ourselves, uh, what is new this time uh, and what has remained the same. Um, in this third series, uh, we will be looking at uh, one of the winners, one of the clear winners of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, these are the big tech firms, uh, the digital monopolies uh, that have amassed so much corporate power. Um, and particularly during the pandemic, we've seen uh, how the world was put on a basically on a tech diet. Everyone is on Zoom every day, the whole day. Um, so 2020, and it looks like 2021 as well, uh, is accelerating many developments uh, that had started to take shape before the pandemic, 
but uh, everything is moving at a faster pace. Uh, what you've seen is how uh, big tech, big tech firms um, have basically changed uh, in the in the eyes uh, of the public from being a helping hand, um, innovators, or simply a force for good. Uh, from this point of view, they have increasingly become seen as these massive corporations that dominate all our technologies that we use on a daily basis. Um, so these firms have amassed uh, unprecedented amounts of financial firepower. Uh, this is affecting other economic sectors, banking, pharma, automobiles, and it is also starving journalism from advertisement income, and it has made a business model from disinformation and surveillance. So to understand well, what this is all about, uh, in this series, we're going to have five or perhaps six episodes to discuss different elements. And slowly we will be moving towards uh, questions about solutions and how to basically re-regulate this environment and how to fight back. But first, we need to understand what we're dealing with. Uh, the first two episodes are basically about that, um, setting the stage, the large view. Uh, what are we talking about? Where does it start? So last week, we had Keen Birch. Uh, he talked about how value is being extracted in our age of what he labeled techno-scientific capitalism um, and how science and technology studies can be a helpful academic approach to understand our time. Um, so this week, we continue with Cecilia Ricap. But uh, before we go into that, uh, I would like to give the floor back to Sarah. Yeah, just uh, quickly on a pragmatic note, uh, let me take you through the setup of the webinar. So Rodrigo and I will soon finish this introduction and then Rodrigo will introduce today's speaker and who will uh, present her view for about uh, 15 minutes. And thereafter, Rodrigo and I have prepared some questions. So we'll interview the speaker for another like 15 minutes. And finally, we have a round of questions from your side and those questions will be read out loud by me and Rodrigo. Uh, it will be a total of one hour. So I'd like to ask you uh, introductions into the chat. And if you have a question, you can put it in the special Q&A window or tab you'll find at the bottom of your screen. So um, if it's uh, a clarification question, you can also write clarification question, but more in general, put your question there. Um, if you think a question is really good, you can also endorse it by putting the thumbs up there and then uh, the, the most endorsed questions uh, will be shown on the top of our screen. So uh, that's a pretty democratic market system, we think, and it always works uh, pretty swell. So wishing you good luck with it. Rodrigo, up to you. So we are very happy today to have uh, Cecilia Ricap with us today. Um, she has four affiliations, so I, I will only uh, talk about two. She's a, a researcher uh, of Conicet in Argentina, and she uh, is a, a researcher at the University of Paris. And um, unlike most economists, she is uh, truly multidisciplinary, uh, and as such can be uh, called a real political economist. Um, her recent book is called Capitalism, Power and Innovation, Intellectual Monopoly Capital Capitalism Uncovered. It is a magnificent book, uh, both conceptually and empirically, um, and it really helps us to understand the world we live in. Um, I think, or I hope, it will be influential, uh, and um, I can recommend it to everyone to read. Um, we are very happy to have Cecilia with us today. So it was very cruel from us to ask her to limit her presentation to only 15 minutes because she has a lot to say and uh, many slides to show. But this is exactly what we did uh, because otherwise we won't have any time for discussion. So uh, in order not to waste any more time, I ask Cecilia to uh, put on her phone. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Rodrigo and Sara, for the presentation. Thank you also Crash Course people for organizing this. I think it's an, a very stimulating and amazing initiative. And, and I would also like to thank all the participants for, for being here, for joining us. I, I will uh, try to be really brief 
uh, so that we can uh, have a lot of time for discussion. And at the end of my presentation, you will have my email, which is basically my name, surname, and at gmail.com. So feel free to write to me or contact me on Twitter or, or in other so social media if you have further questions or if you would like to have access to my research. So very quickly, um, today I will uh, try to give you an introduction to intellectual monopoly capitalism and also focus on big tech companies which are a paradigmatic, but not the only example of intellectual monopolies, focusing on their technological convergence. So I will focus today on what big tech companies have in common. And why monopolies? Let's start, start over there. I've seen that many of you come from the economics field. So probably you're familiarized with the left-hand side figure that I'm showing to you. It's the new classical economic way of understanding monopolies. Basically, uh, they only look at one market, so forget everything else in the world, and just focus on the idea of a single company that has um, profits that are above what is considered as normal for neoclassical economics. So when I come and, and start speaking about intellectual monopoly capitalism, it often happens to me that people ask me, hey, why a monopoly? First, Amazon, for instance, was not profitable for many years. And even now it has a relatively low profit rate. And if you think more uh, in terms of markets and e-commerce as a new form of market, there are many platforms offering e-commerce marketplaces. And the same could be said about the smartphone industry. So why should I call Apple an intellectual monopoly or the ads industry for the case of Facebook and Google? Of course, there would be some people, and I could have answered, hey, but look, you're not considering, for instance, that a Microsoft Windows is pretty much in every computer that doesn't have, um, that is not an, 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 a computer from Apple. And you could also say that uh, Google search engine, it's pretty much the way we look for things online all the time, uh, which reflects in its 90, around 90% of market share. And uh, we can also think, for instance, of Google Android or Apple's iOS as two separate monopolies. We cannot choose between them. If I have a smartphone that is not an iPhone, I cannot have iOS. But this would still be a kind of tip of the iceberg analysis. And why a tip of the iceberg? Because we normally focus or uh, neoclassical economics and also some, some people from, from other streams of thought normally focus on the market idea of a monopoly or market monopolies, but do not try to understand that below that, be an, an underlying the idea of one single company in a market or, or a company with a huge market power, uh, what we should actually be looking at, and, and it's often overlooked, is our production and innovation social relations and how these production and innovation relations are power relations and how these power relations ultimately may lead to, in some cases, to extreme mar market power. It may also lead to what seems to be more competitive markets, but what all the companies that I've been mentioning so far, what big tech companies have also in common with big pharma companies and other big corporations of contemporary capitalism is that they are what I call as intellectual monopolies. And just to give you a first brief definition, these are firms, that rely on a permanent and expanding monopoly over portions of society's knowledge. And this knowledge that they monopolize is transformed into intangible assets that allow them to garner rents, therefore to garner part of the value that is produced in society and be kept by a few big corporations. So I know that the last time you discussed with Keen, of an intangible asset. So I will not go in deep into this definition. On the left side, you have the OECD definition of an intangible asset. And on the right side, you have some examples or most frequent examples used to think of uh, intangible assets. What's uh, missing in the right-hand side is something extremely important for understanding the digital economy. And this is uh, big data. Data and how data is being transformed also into an intangible asset. Overall, we can say that uh, intangibles are, are knowledge, and it's knowledge that has been introduced to the economic sphere. And once it's transformed or turned into an asset, it becomes an exclusive good. So it's access, even though knowledge is a non-rival good, it's access becomes curtailed. 
And this uh, ends up contributing to the reproduction of capitalism, but in a way in which knowledge ceases to be publicly accessible, and like the idea of public knowledge or commons knowledge. And intangibles include secrecy. And this is also of utmost importance for understanding big tech companies, intellectual monopolies. And just to give you some examples, only 15% of all the artificial intelligence papers disclose their code. So actually the knowledge that, that it's been, uh, uh, that it's been created. So the paper tells what the artificial intelligence model does, but not how it does it. So knowledge is still being curtailed even, or access to knowledge is being curtailed, even though they, there are papers being published on those results. And just other very known examples are the Google, Google search algorithm, Amazon's marketplace algorithm, and in general, uh, big data that is stored, that are stored by big tech companies is also kept secret. And there are several other examples that, that we could go in deep afterwards in the Q&A. So let me just uh, move now to, to sketch in just a few slides what intellectual monopoly capitalism is about. And it's... In a way, we can think of it as the convergence of four transformations. On the one hand, we have the characteristics of knowledge, and I will go into this later on, but there are some characteristics, features of knowledge that, of course, were always there, but we need to consider them to understand what, why we are where we are now. Together with that, um, a, there is another important dimension that I will tackle in a second also, which is the idea of how capital, capitalist competition unfolds and how it has led to what I call firms' technological differentiation. But on top of that, there were institutional and political transformations. I will only briefly refer to them. And in the fourth place, technological changes, such as ICT, that allowed knowledge to be produced at one end of the world or at several ends of the world to be uh, to be split or modularized or sliced in different portions and parts, and ultimately to be monetized at the other end of the world only by one or a few companies. So knowledge modularity is key for the organization also of what I will call, what I call together with Val Lundval, corporate innovation systems, and I will go to that also later in the presentation. So just in terms of political transformations, there are three big things to have in mind. And they're all related to the US and how the US spread these transformations to the rest of the world. First, since the 80s in particular, we see a process of strengthening uh, intellectual property rights. This happened internally in the US with uh, transformations such as the Bay Dole Act, which basically allowed to patent knowledge that was funded with public funds and other transformations that also included the possibility to patent living beings and algorithms. So good for big pharma, the first one, good for big tech, the second one. And all these transformations, a more stringent, a more privatized uh, intellectual property rights regime was then expanded to the rest of the world with the TRIPS agreements. And, and it was precisely to TRIPS what Asada was referring before. This is the global intellectual property regime that now stands in the world and that uh, has contributed to knowledge privatization. But it was not only these uh, transformations in terms of intellectual property rights, but also in terms of corporate taxes and in terms of anti antitrust policy that contributed to create these uh, intellectual monopolies. And we can go back to this uh, later in the Q&A if you're interested in it. And going briefly into knowledge characteristics or traits and how these uh, contributed or or triggered firm's technological differentiation, the first thing to say is that when I speak of intellectual monopolies, I speak of companies that are monopolizing access to knowledge. And this goes beyond intellectual property rights concentration. It's part of the story is intellectual property rights concentration, but it's not only that. And that's why I showed you the slide of, of secrecy and the role of the place of secrecy. The other thing is that once knowledge becomes an asset, as I mentioned before, its owner can garner intellectual rents. And these rents are a redistribution of value that is enabled by this asceticization of a good or resource. The case of knowledge is particular because knowledge is built on previous knowledge. This is an, and therefore it 
it's a way of producing that triggers accumulative causation. And as more knowledge we produce, we are better prepared to understand the new knowledge and to absorb it. This idea of absorptive capacity is not only for individuals, but also for firms. A company that has innovated will have higher chances to innovate again based on its previous knowledge, on the previous innovation. And a process where this starts happening all over again and again and again is a self-reinforcing process aided by institutional and legal and political transformations that has led to the concentration of, of intangible assets in few, uh, in few firms. And this is part of uh, what explains basically these stylized facts, which I will just mention them very briefly. But the basic idea is that the overall value produced in society is more and more concentrated by corporate profits. So a bigger slice of the cake is being kept by companies, in particular, by those companies that are the largest corporations. And among them, the largest corporations, when we look at them, we see two things. They are digital intensive companies and most of their assets are intangible assets. And here you have just one example. In 1917, 17% of the Standard & Poor's 500 assets were intangibles. And now that figure is around 84%. So in this big context, as I mentioned, big tech companies are a paradigmatic example. Now I will briefly go into the ways these companies have, um, have managed to become a special type of intellectual monopoly which is a data-driven intellectual monopoly. So their intellectual monopoly, their capacity to monopolize knowledge and profit from that knowledge is based on the way, or it's based on their capacity to harvest data. I will not go into in deep into this, but basically it's just, uh, these figures just show you two things. The first one is that big tech companies are the largest companies in market capitalization. And that's the left-hand side. And the right-hand side shows you that these companies are the big winners of the pandemic. With Keen, you already discussed about this, and I'm only interested in showing you the why. How come these companies became so powerful? And this leads us to um, their capacity to constantly expand their knowledge monopoly and their concentration of intangibles. And how they do so? They do so by being, as I mentioned, data-driven intellectual monopolies. So they basically harvest big data, process it with artificial intelligence, in particular with deep learning and neural network algorithms. We can go more in deep into these forms of uh, machine learning approaches afterwards. But these are approaches that allow the algorithm to modify itself, to learn as it processes more data. The result of this process is called digital intelligence, and it can be used to direct, to orient businesses, to create new businesses, and also ultimately to keep on innovating. So it is on this basis that these companies are constantly innovating. And when we think of big data and AI, there is a way of evidencing the importance these uh, two technologies or this technology package has for big tech companies. And the way you're doing it is by looking at the content of their scientific publications. And this is what I've done here. And you can see it for five different companies. And uh, the green tag, the, yeah, the, the terms that are in green refer to machine learning and in particular to deep neural networks or neural networks. So the approaches they are used to process the data in blue, you have terms that refer to data. And in yellow, you have terms that refer to the applications of these uh, da big data and artificial intelligence uh, technologies. So basically what we see here are two things. One, that the most important topics that these companies are doing research on are related to artificial intelligence and big data and its applications. And two, that all these companies in spite of their different businesses, in spite of their differences, are working along the same lines on the same topics. But they're not working on this by themselves. And this is another important dimension because it is pretty much clear for everyone that these companies concentrate data, but it's not so clear that these companies are actually developing knowledge in what we call corporate innovation systems. These are basically innovation networks that are organized and planned by the intellectual monopoly 
but where several organizations participate. And here we have a second key concept, and this is the concept of predation as a direct manifestation of power, a direct relation of spoliation. And what are intellectual monopolies spoliating? Knowledge. And they are privatizing and monopolizing that knowledge. And a way to look at this is by seeing, for instance, in the case of Amazon, this is a um, proxy of Amazon's uh, corporate innovation system. We should add also the outsourced innovation models that are developed by app developers and also the uh, work of people working in open source that ends, uh, whose work ends up being monetized by Amazon. But here, what you have plotted are the uh, most frequent co-authors of Amazon's publications. And there are several universities here. I just chose the top 50 so that it's the, so that the network map is clearer. And you can see several uh, universities. You can also see even Microsoft, for instance, here, Google over here. So technological cooperation between big tech companies. But even though they publish papers and they, they are for, they are doing research with a lot of organizations. And here you have the number of authoring organizations of this selected big tech. When it comes to patenting, they patent by themselves, which means that they are keeping the results and they are keeping the research for their own um, economic profit. So summing up, because I'm short, uh, what I've mentioned is that capitalism is led by these data-driven intellectual monopolies and that they predate knowledge, including data. And also, we did not have the time to speak about this, but the fact that they become intellectual monopolies allows them to organize global value chains, platforms, and other production structures from which they also predate value. They organize corporate innovation systems from which they collect most of the associated rents. And there are other things related to this that we did not cover, but I will gladly discuss about them in the Q&A. For instance, how big tech companies profit from open source software, how they rely on mergers and in particular acquisitions in the case of big tech. And also that part of their monopoly relies on concentrating the tangible assets that are required to keep harvesting and analyzing data. This context has several implications for workers, for the peripheries, not only for people that are working for the subordinate companies that need to accept the uh, conditions imposed by big tech companies, but also for people working for big tech companies. And, and of course, the case of Amazon and its warehouses is well known, but even people working on, on uh, qualified positions also uh, need to accept, well, let, let's, let's discuss later about that, but also people in qualified positions end up accepting uh, informal or precarious positions just to be working for these companies. When it comes to the peripheries, there is a process where knowledge produced in peripheral countries and data produced in peripheral countries is being extracted and monetized by corporations from the global north. And this is why we can speak of digital colonialism or a division of creative la labor. And there is also a huge dimension of discussions in terms of geopolitical uh, topics. And the US-China trade war is actually part of a tech conflict. The US is aware of China's capacity to catch up, in particular in artificial intelligence, and it's trying to counterbalance that. And when I say the US, I should say big tech companies from the U.S., because those that are writing the policy recommendations, for instance, for the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, are the representatives of big tech companies. So big tech companies actually are becoming policymakers. They also define the rules in what can, could be called their digital republics. And uh, they, therefore, even though they, rein they reinforce their state's hegemony, so the U.S. is stronger because it has big tech companies. At the same time, there are several clashes of power between states and big tech. So to conclude, what is to be done? There are several dimensions here, and we can also discuss this uh, later on. But let me just say three things. First, the idea of a market-based antitrust, so more competition, will not work. Because the products these companies are offering become cheaper and better when we only have one firm offering them. This is what it's called in the, in the economic textbook, a natural monopoly. Think of search engines and how inefficient it would be if we need to look at 10 different places to search for one thing. And therefore, the AI models will not be as good because they learn as they process more searches. So competition claims 
in this sector are not the best for society. And the same happens with data privacy acts, which ultimately contribute to knowledge privatization and do not take into account new uh, developments in AI that are actually making tech companies less reliant on data. So why not think about global public or commons good? Of course, the feasibility depends on activism. And in the meantime, we should also think of taxes, taxing revenues, taxing shareholders and asset managers, because these companies uh, use tax havens and also they are so reliant on R&D that their profits ends up being lower on what they should be because of the way we calculate profits. So uh, with this, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry it was a little bit longer than 15 minutes. Um, and I hope you have a lot of questions and I'm eager to answer in them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Uh, what a wonderful story. Um, I'd like to ask uh, all attendees who have questions to put them in the Q&A tab. If you like a question, you can endorse it. And there's already quite some questions there. Um, one question is, is there a paperback version of your book or will it be published? Because uh, your book is uh, quite expensive and there's a lot of people eager to read it. So, so um, yeah, the book is super expensive, I know, especially from people from the Global South. Um, but you can feel free to contact me if you're interested in the book. Um, that's what I can tell you um, because this is being recorded. But but yeah, but feel free to contact me and 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 we can figure it out. Um, that concerning the book. Great. So and and it is it is in paperback, but it's super expensive. It's like a hundred and something right. dollars. I don't even have my copies. I was supposed to get my copies in France, but then I could not travel because of the pandemic. So yeah, so I cannot even show you a copy. Well, but thanks anyways, we'll categorize this answer as uh, trade secrets. So uh, <laughs> now to the content, uh, I'd like to ask you something about uh, big tech and big data. Uh, you already mentioned the big data a couple of times. Um, and yeah, uh, what we're also trying to uh, expose here in this series is that uh, the problem with those big tech monopolies uh, goes way beyond the, the common sense privacy issues and, and personal data concerns that we, I think, all witness also today being in Zoom. Uh, and in this respect, the concept of big data is quite important and, and your concept of data-driven uh, intellectual monopolies. And can you explain what you mean exactly by big data and also how big data is becoming an intangible asset under uh, intellectual monopoly uh, capitalism and also what the problem thereof is? Okay, yeah, I, I will try to be brief um, because there are many interesting questions in, in uh, what you mentioned, Tara. Uh, first, a brief definition on big data. So uh, let's think of it as huge pools of data sources. So you have a data source, data points extracted from many places all over the world, but related to the same topics. Originally, they were supposed to be concentrated in the same database, but this may also change in the future because algorithms are now even able to learn without concentrating all the data. So we need to think of it in a more abstract way and in as data sources, data pools, and typically, uh, 15,000 data points uh, are what's the the uh, the threshold to consider it big data. So, and and the other part of the question was related to how big data becomes an intangible asset and and, and how it's uh, related or affecting this this context of intellectual monopoly capitalism. So, um, let me just say that by harvesting these data points from same sources and processing them. Uh, such as we do, and, and this is also a, a good analogy. Some of you or most of you are economists. So we usually do that. We, uh, we retrieve data and we put all that data together and through statistical analysis, econometrics and other forms of, of descriptive statistics also, we try to analyze these data sources. And what, what's the ultimate aim? We want to produce knowledge. We want to produce insights. We want to drive from the, that data, insights and knowledge. So basically, analyzing big data, harvesting big data operates in the same way. But the difference is that, um, the, 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 first of all, the, so the size of those uh, data sources is way bigger. And all these different data sources can be interconnected because they are uh, either referring to the same person or the same organization. So you can put all that data together. And of course, it would be impossible for us as human beings to process all that data. But by using artificial intelligence algorithms, in particular, 
machine learning algorithms, what the algorithm does is to process all that data and extract the most important things. Let's put it in those terms. And those most important things are the digital intelligence that is then used by big tech companies. Big data becomes an asset because big data is privately accessed and processed by these big tech companies. And it's been, uh, whereas the data has been produced all around the world by society at large. And at the same time, the algorithms that these companies use are at least partly produced by other organizations. However, by appropriating all the data and harvesting all this data and using these algorithms, the, the final version, let's put it that way, of the algorithm by themselves, they keep the result of the process for themselves, which is the digital intelligence. And that's how the process works. In particular, as I was mentioning, there is a powerful development within machine learning that is called deep learning and coupled with neural networks allows uh, to develop artificial intelligence models that just in one word, learn by themselves. And this is why we can think of a new method of invention because the algorithms by themselves are learning, are improving by themselves, and are producing constantly new digital intelligence, new insights, new knowledge that can be used for the uh, for a better life for society or for more profit for private firms. And it's the latter what's going on right now. Great. Thanks a lot. I would have a follow-up question, but actually we also have a follow-up question from, from Jeremy, uh, who is working uh, behind the scenes here at this webinar. And that question is, um, what are the consequences of the balance of power with big tech or big tech versus uh, alternative tech solutions? Well, um, I, I've done, I, I will also, like, I will try to be even shorter when answering and refer to my research. I. I, I, I don't want to refer to my research because, because I think it's the best option there. It's just to say, if you want to dig more into what I think about that, you can. So you can read chapter three of my book because there I work precisely on how big tech companies, even though they're intellectual monopolies, they profit and use open source and open access for their own benefit. So in the last years, in particular, in the last five, six years, there's been a, a huge transformation because before big tech companies were uh, usually against open access, open source, because that meant to disclose knowledge and actually they were enclosing knowledge. But they found out that um, knowledge is a puzzle, it's a big puzzle. And this works perfectly fine for the case of algorithms because actually code is made up of different easier for someone that is not a programmer, sentences. And that sentences can be split up. So if you have one piece of the puzzle in open access or open source, and you have a lot of developers contributing because open source is a way of counter, or was, was uh, developed as a way of counterbalancing the power of knowledge privatization, and you have a lot of people collaborating as a community to develop that knowledge, so that piece of the puzzle is being developed by a lot of people and you as a big tech are not paying for that. But then that piece of the puzzle makes sense only once it is put in the big picture, in the overall puzzle. And that's, and part of, the, of those pieces are kept secret. Key parts are kept secret. So those profiting the most, even from open access, end up being the big tech. Yeah, because they have the overview of all. Uh, Rodrigo, I think it's your turn. Hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> well, there's still many interesting questions, of course, in the field of data. Uh, not the least when we go to surveillance techniques and, and, and that, but um, yeah, I would like to move into a, a different direction. Um, so an important argument uh, you make in your book is about the self-enforcing mechanisms uh, through which these intellectual monopolies grow larger at the expense of the rest. Uh, and so yeah, you point to different mechanisms that produce these virtuous cycles. Um, my question, uh, it's about finance and the financial resources. 
uh, in your presentation, you you pointed to uh, how collaboration with universities uh, and uh, yeah the the, the the way in which these big tech firms can coordinate these research labs and, and research networks enable them to to, to capture um, value from that. But uh, if we include the financial resources that big tech have accumulated in time, and particularly uh, since the global financial crisis, the, the massive accumulated financial assets, the um, unlimited uh, capacity to borrow, especially now with central banks and their Q, uh, QE policies, uh, insanely high share prices. Um, so this financial firepower yeah, enables them to. I um, I, I yeah, tend to, to see that there are that obstacles to be put in the way, uh, so what, and a way if, of, if of counterbalancing the their they power uh, goes in many directions. Growing, we see more and, and more that uh, what, what counts for these companies this, is precisely their market capitalization. And that big thing, uh, like so what happened yesterday in the US with uh, can be, uh, Biden saying we will support, and this is the case it's, it's for Big Pharma, but it's a good example. Uh, the US will support the vaccine waiver at the global level to contribute to, to end the pandemic, resulted in a huge drop in the market capitalization of big pharma companies. So uh, the ones that need to pay ultimately are the shareholders, the asset managers, the, and and there's, there are ways to do that, as I was mentioning in the case of taxing, taxing revenues, taxing revenues where they are um, made, and also taxing uh, fin the financial sector. And why is this? It's because um, in, in a recently published paper with, with Cedric Duran, with Joel Reinovich, and Tristan Upre, uh, we discuss about how financialization changed in this century. And we, we explain it as the turn from financialization mark one to financialization mark two. And just in a nutshell, uh, mark two, this new uh, form of financialization, uh, it's characterized by, yes, by low investment and high payment to shareholders, but these are symptomatic, actually, of a lack of sufficiently profitable opportunities for investment due to insufficient demand and monopoly power. And this includes stifling innovation due to intellectual monopoly capitalism. There are a few companies that are concentrating and accumulating more and more capital, whereas the rest subordinate to them. So the result is that there is no point for the rest to try to catch up, to try to uh, invest. There, there is definitely no uh, no opportunity because all the possible opportunities and, and most of the innovation is being concentrated by fewer and fewer companies. So this context, of course, requires a lot of policy intervention. But in my opinion, solving this requires global and coordinated efforts and should not be, for instance, the U.S. deciding to break them up or the US deciding to regulate them because actually they are profiting from all over the world. So uh, the first step should be to tax these companies all around the world. And there are some initiatives going on beyond the initiatives of poor countries. In Southeast Asia, there are many countries trying to establish their own uh, revenue taxes for these companies. And this has been discussed elsewhere as well. But these states will need an enforcement capacity sufficient to uh, to to enact all these uh, ideas and transformations. And in the long term, I think we should try to uh, go uh, as activists, actually, to, to push for what I was mentioning, a global or commons public goods. Um, that's the only uh, ultimate solution. Transforming the intellectual property rights regime would also be important, but not enough, but it's of, of utmost importance. And to do that, we need to change people's mindsets. If the pandemic is, is useful for something, is to make everyone realized that intellectual property rights make no sense. They are not rewarding the inventor. The, Astra, the, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was developed by Oxford and the profits go to AstraZeneca. Yeah, quite problematic. Um, Rodrigo, do we have time for one more question before we go to the attendees or not? I think that it's, it would be good to go to the, to the Q&A. I think so too, yeah. because we have only like 15 minutes left. Um, so the first question is um, uh, heavily endorsed uh, and it's by uh, Dick de Graaf. Um, and the question is, how do you explain the extremely high market valuation of tech companies which have hardly proved to be profitable? Uh, see, for example, the dot-com uh, bubble burst in the 90s. Okay, so uh, I usually do not speak of, uh, for instance, platforms. 
uh, there is very common to uh, speak of all these companies as platforms. I think that platforms confuses the structure, a particular structure or way of organizing production processes with the capital accumulation strategy of certain companies. And within platform or tech companies, you have thriving companies like the big tech companies that became intellectual monopolies. And you also have other companies that are attempting to achieve that intellectual monopoly position, but fail in the process. Venture capital does not know and, and uh, where to put the money in advance. You don't know where, which will the next Google be. So uh, in this process of potential intellectual monopolies being developed, there are a lot of both private investors like private venture capitals, but also asset managers that manage the, the savings of even uh, uh, pension funds and insurance funds and so on that bet on these companies. And it was allowed by the U.S., to uh, conduct an IPO without profits. This was one of the changes that, that came on the, the institutional and political changes I was mentioning before. And this is part of what helped these companies to go public. It's how they go public, not because of this uh, ideal mindset of you go public and become a public company because you are um, a healthy business. They go public to get more fundings to prove that their idea is good, either to be acquired by a big tech company or to eventually, but but for very, very few cases, become a successful. Why most of them fail? One of the reasons is the type of data they get access to. If you see the data Google gets access to compared to Uber's data, even Uber's business fits with data Google because Uber uses Waze or Google Maps. So an Uber only has a very narrow data source to infer and produce digital intelligence, whereas Google has so many data sources that can produce way more digital intelligence, expand this business and innovate more and more. So that's also why these companies are fair. Yeah, very clear answer, I think. Uh, Rodrigo. Yeah, I have a, an, a question by um, Ignacio Juncos, if I pronounce his name right. Uh, and his name, his question is about um, oligopolies. So why why do you frame your study in terms of monopolies rather than oligopolies? Well, it, this goes back to what I was saying in the first slides. Uh, the knowledge that Google has about us is not the same knowledge that Amazon has about us, is not the same knowledge that Facebook has about us. They are in close. We cannot think knowledge, each knowledge point or each portion of knowledge is different from the other. So I can have two pieces of paper. So I could have like this sheet of paper and this other sheet of paper, and they are both equal. So if one company concentrates part of the sheets of paper and the other one concentrates the other part of the sheets of paper in the world, they would be an oligopoly. But in my case, these are not intellectual oligopolies because each of them monopolizes different portions of knowledge. I, I don't know if this uh, is clear or you need a follow-up on this because this is a very important part of the discussion. This has also been said to me, like they are actually oligopolists. And I think that people still think in terms of markets and not in, in terms of how knowledge is monopolized and the specificities of knowledge. Thank you. And yeah, maybe as a, as a very quick follow-up, um, what do you think of this idea that these large... U.S. big tech firms, in a way, are interrelated to each other uh, and act as a collective gatekeeper, uh, as a sort of an infrastructural core, uh, and and th th this makes their monopoly power even larger than the individual monopolies. Well, actually, in my research, one of the things that I do, and, and it's uh, it's in the book, it's also in the paper we published together with Val Lundval, we talk about technological cooperation because they actually cooperate for technology. If you look at the, at the authors of, or, or the co-authors of this company, scientific publications, among the most frequent co-authors, you have other big tech companies. So they're actually working together. And is this process of knowledge modularity 
what allows them to work together for some knowledge steps, for some parts where their technologies converge and then profit from that results in different ways. Of course, since they are converging more and more towards artificial intelligence and big data, they start operating in the same markets, some of them in particular. And you can think of Amazon, Microsoft, and Google as the absolute leaders of the cloud computing business. And this is an outcome or a cholera, cholera, well, that part, that word of, um, of their, um, developments of, of their corporate innovation systems, actually developments in terms of AI and big data. They were so advanced that at some point they realized that they could outsource part of the solutions, not the ultimate algorithm, but at least like very state of the art algorithms to uh, the rest of the companies. So yes, they work as gatekeepers all together. Yes, but, but more importantly, they do research all together and they profit from monopolizing and access to knowledge that is being produced also by universities, by public research organizations, by startups. And they do that in part together while at the same time they compete for technology. Yeah, very uh, clear answer again. Uh, next question is by uh, Veronica Uribe A. Uh, and it goes as following. Would you expand a little more on the implications for workers and peripheries? I'm particularly interested in the uh, of, on the value chains. And I know that there's also some people from the labor unions present here. So maybe you can say something about the, the implications thereof for labor unions. Yes. So one thing to say is that uh, that I didn't have the time to mention. And is that another condition that contributed to intellectual monopoly capitalism was the dismantling of unions, how they were severely attacked uh, from neoliberal you know, policies. And of course, uh, corporations uh, profited from that process. So the weakening of the workers' power to, to bargain against capital also contributes to explain the, the contemporary situation we are living in. So that as, as, a first, uh, as a first consideration. In terms of the implication for workers, we need to consider uh, two things, basically. Uh, I did not have the time to expand um, on this analysis, but you can read it in my work. When I speak of subordinate companies, I distinguish different types of subordinate companies. You have, just, in, in, uh, just to give you an example, you have, for instance, Apple as an intellectual monopoly, and then you have Foxconn as the company that manufactures the iPhones. Foxconn is what I call a compliant company. It's a company that it's fast to adopt, the new technologies required by Apple, and that is there complying to with all the requirements that Apple imposes to it. Then you have other companies that are laggard companies, typically small companies. Most of the companies from the peripheries tend to be uh, laggard companies. These are companies that produce with, uh, with very outdated techniques, and their only advantage, the only way they, to, to continue operating is by offering really cheap prices. And they do so by um, diminishing the labor, like salaries, wages, and also by worsening labor conditions, working conditions. On top of these two companies, you have a third type of subordinate company. And this is typically the startup, the company that is not producing commodities, but is producing knowledge parts of these pieces of the puzzle that will be integrated by intellectual monopolies and that are being developed in their corporate innovation systems. In each of these companies, the way to treat workers differs. In the complier and laggard companies, the way to compensate for the value that is being appropriated by intellectual monopolies is the in part directly, as I was mentioning, with lower salaries and worse labor conditions. So the consequences of why Fox or, or the, not the concept, but the causes of why Foxconn workers receive su such low wages is not only because of the rules and, and norms of, of China that allow for that, but it's also because of this technological differentiation process and the way Apple can um, require or oblige other companies ultimately to accept its uh, requirements. In the case of the startup companies, uh, the innovating companies, salaries are better but these salaries are uh, are also attached to a very um, a very unstable position, and a way to compensate for that is to 
pretend to transform the worker into part of the owners of the enterprises. And there is a very good um, documentary of extreme case of how this usually goes wrong, which is the case of WeWork. And finally, in the case of, of the intellectual monopolies, uh, usually you would expect people to earn the best salaries and have the best working conditions and so on. But this is only part of the story. Then need to cross this technological differentiation between firms and how this is uh, impacting on workers' conditions, considering the level of qualification. So if you work for Amazon at a warehouse, Amazon will be able to pay you a little bit more than the other retail because it is an intellectual monopoly, but you would still suffer extreme working conditions and you would still have a low salary. And actually, that extra that Amazon pays to the workers, it, it's... Uh, it's more than compensated for Amazon's profits by the way workers are forced to work and how they are controlled. So it's not just looking at the different type of firm and think, okay, if I want to work for a firm, I want to work for an intellectual monopoly because my life would be better. Well, not so much. And also you can see all the, the issues, even in big tech companies that are now emerging of how discriminatory policies and also precarious working conditions, even for people that, are, that become trainees, in, in working at, at qualified positions in these companies. Um, thank you. We, mm. we are approaching the end. Yeah, and I didn't mention, I'm sorry, I didn't mention the, the things about the peripheries. I strongly recommend the person that asked that question or anyone, if you're interested in that, to write to me afterwards and I can share you my research on that because I think we, we don't have much time. I'm so sorry. Yeah, and we'll also uh, share the show notes on the website, like uh, the reference to the WeWork documentary and the like. I propose that we have one last question. Um, and yeah, of course, there's so many issues to be discussed, the geopolitics, the, the effects on the global south, etc. But we don't have time for that now. Uh, there will be other sessions that will be dealing with that. But maybe it would be good to think about how perhaps at the end we can still have a panel discussion on this uh, in a few weeks' time. But the, the last question um, on my list here is by Indra Rumkens. Uh, it's um, regarding taxing these companies' revenues where they are made. Where exactly would you say that is? Where the intellectual property is incorporated, where the headquarter is, where the users are? Um, perhaps an example. So basically how to tax these companies that are everywhere but nowhere. So um, it is pretty clear where they make the revenues. Uh, on the one hand, they make the revenues where users are. So you can see the number of users, even you can see the number of posts they make, the number of purchases they make, the prices of the sales that are being sales that are being made. So uh, so that's uh, feasible from the from the standpoint of what's being sold in the different platforms and so on that these companies organize. If you are thinking of cloud computing business, it's super easy to distinguish between, for instance, in Amazon Web Services, the different companies that are purchasing their services from different parts of the world. So, so that should be kept in mind. But at the same time, it should be the uh, other measures should be included. There is no, and, and let me emphasize this, there is no one single measure that will transform this situation. It's a bunch, a bundle of policies that organized together in a planned and clear way, in a global way. You also need, for instance, to include uh, minimum tax, minimum wages around the world to limit the, the value flows from the complier or, or laggard companies that are mostly based in the peripheries towards intellectual monopolies in the global north, for instance. That should also be put in place. And in terms of intellectual property rights, there are several things to consider. Uh, just to tackle part of the discussion about the peripheries, knowledge, when it should, uh, if, if it's been produced in the peripheries, either governments should make sure that that knowledge is not being appropriated by single companies and, and aim to keep that knowledge public, or if that cannot be done, then different mechanisms should be put in place to reward the inventor, but without providing a long-term intellectual property over the result. Because every piece of knowledge, and I strongly recommend you to read Beblen about this, every piece of knowledge relies on previous knowledge. 
So there is no such a thing as one inventor of a couple of inventors. We are always inventing things on the basis of what humans invented before. So this idea also of rewarding the inventor uh, should be at least challenged. Mm. So social relations. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm afraid we've come to an ending more or less. Uh, as always, time uh, time flies. And thank you so much, Cecilia, for your fantastic presentation and also uh, your extremely clear uh, answering of very complex questions. It's really impressive. And I wish we could go on for hours, but we can't. Although as Crash Course teams, we're still considering how we can put uh, attendees in touch with each other because we know that there's a lot of uh, yeah, interest in, in discussing uh, matters uh, further on another level. Uh, but for now, thanks again. And uh, the recording will be put online, of course, the recording of the webinar, and there'll be a podcast version. Uh, and we'll also put uh, show notes online, uh, reference to articles and documentaries that uh, Cecilia made. Um, I'd like to thank you all for participating uh, in this webinar of Crash Course on uh, Big Tech, techno feudalism, <laughs> and Democracy. Yes, where'd you go? Yeah, one thing that we forgot, that there was a little time, is uh, that we would like to ask Cecilia to ask a question to Farva Sial. Uh, I, was I was getting oh, there. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no yeah. worries. But thanks for reminding, because the next <laughs> webinar is actually with Farva Sial, which is uh, on the 20th of May. Uh, at four o'clock again, it will be one hour, and Farva Sial will speak on um, platforms and the limits of competition policy. So it will be a lot about regulation. If you're interested, by the way, in um, big tech and, and the global south or the, the consequences for the uh, periphery countries, also please stay tuned because there will be an episode on that as well. But Farwa Seal in two weeks time, 20th of May, uh, will speak about uh, the limits of competition policy. And she is a senior policy and advocacy officer in development finance at Eurodat and also a research follow, a fellow sorry, at the Global Development Institute, GDI, at the University of Manchester. And her research focuses on uh, comparative development, uh, industrial policy, corporations, and the evolving dynamics of late capitalism in the context of financialization and technological development. We have such awesome speakers always. So, uh, Cecilia, uh, do you perhaps have a question for Farwa? I know that you know each other um, and we'd be very interested in hearing from you what you'd like to ask her. So uh, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I, I would very much like to ask Farwa about the, the global reach of the policies that are required. We are directly uh, talking about global corporations that are building global markets. And however, um, the policymakers remain mostly national or regional and the global organizations or international organizations, and this has been shown during this pandemic, are not uh, prepared, at least let's put in those words, are not prepared to tackle these type of challenges. So how, how does she conceive um, policies that can be uh, implemented at a global level because it's evident that they require to be implemented at a global level to to have positive results. If she sees this feasible or not, or how could this be done? Yeah, interesting. So we'll find out whether Farwa is an optimist or not in two weeks' time. Uh, so thank you again, Celia, and thank you all uh, attendees and also team, of course. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to show you our website so that you know uh, how it works uh, in terms of uh, subscribing to our newsletter. So this is our lovely website. Um, let me just put this up a little bit, crashcourseeconomics.org. Uh, you can here see uh, the third episode with Farah Sial. And if you click over here uh, on the sign up now sign, uh, you can sign up for the webinar. And here in the below, all the way over here, you can also sign up for our newsletter and then you'll be sure that you won't miss anything in the future. So hope to see you all in two weeks time, 20th of May. Um, we'll see you, Cecilia, uh, in a recap soon uh, in five minutes and see all the others uh, in two weeks time, hopefully. Uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. See you.